All right, I'd like to call uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting to order at 11 o'clock, 11.01, August the 10th, 2022. Um, approval, I, I was going to add a couple late items. So for discussion, we're going to move 5A or 5E to 5A and everything else will flip back one. Then between the replaced 5A and 5B, which is old fall machine, we'd like to have a discussion about uh, building permits versus development permits. So we could get a clear understanding of why that area over there is different than most places in town. And what else are we doing? That was it. That's it. All right. Yeah. So Recommendation that the Planning and Development Committee meeting agenda for August 10th, 2022 be approved as amended. Yes, yes. Okay, all in favor? Good. Adoption of the minutes. Approval of the minutes. Recommendation that the minutes of the Planning and Development Committee meeting held on July 27th, 2022 be adopted. Very good. Development services update. Scott? We have our list of applications. Uh, so the bold ones are ones that are being considered today. And um, then we have a couple of them looking at August 24th and probably most of the ones today we'll try to get to the, uh, the August 24th council meeting as well. Uh, nothing really new to report on any of the other ones. Um, yeah, they're all kind of moving forward. Um, as they should. So. Okay, good. So, okay, uh, Gord said he's going to be here in a minute. So, got a battery problem, whatever that is. Sorry, um, any questions on? On the applications? And well, such so how many are you thinking are going to it kind of i'm kind of slow today and yeah. it flashed a little quickly so how many are you thinking are going to council august 24th it's gonna be a big one so we have probably the five today and then you can see one two four so at least seven so, busy day yeah because there's no council meeting today, yeah so, yeah just yeah. us yeah. And that gave some people an outing for the day, I guess. So that's good. No, nothing else on the development services update? Yeah, um, 12, 1201 Chu Schwab. That is the, um, that's the distillery. Right. That's the same. That's that one. Okay. So the, the variance was issued. Yeah. Um, and the DP, uh, he was still. Trying to make up his mind on making some decisions. Okay. Okay. So. You just need his not time. on hold because of us. No, no, no. Yeah, he was just taking his time. Like I guess the cost of getting his drawings. Um, so we do have the drawings, and then we were still waiting for his parking plan and his landscaping. I got the parking plan. Okay. Um, so just wait for his landscaping. So basically, like what that in front of the addition and what he's going to do with that. The fence that he's completely covered over with siding on Main Street. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Five new business, 5E, which is now 5A, which uh, is. Uh, Recommendation that the Planning and Development Committee recommend the District of Sycamus issue development variance number 22-234-P to very District of Sycamus Voting Bylaw 101-1993 Section 6034, eight side setbacks from 6 to 2.3 meters for a deck from one and two accessory residential buildings for a carport and deck. 
So, yeah, so this is a, a variance um, for a side setback, and it's from the, you know, the, the imaginary uh, parcel line for the individual um, site. Um, there you can see the property. We should get an updated air photo because I think most of the most of the units or a lot of units are already in place. Um, and then you can see where it's located um, on the property. OCB designation is medium density residential. I'm guessing just off the top of my head. Um, and uh, the zoning is R four, which is the um, home residential zone. Then you can see the the variances. So um, right now the bylaw and the strict interpretation of the bylaw um, only one accessory residential building and uh, and anything we're considering anything uh, residential or accessory building. Um, so the deck and the carport would each be considered uh, an accessory residential building. Limited to one, so vary that from one to two. Um, and then the other uh, variance is the varying the, the setback for the deck from six meters um, to 2.3 meters. So um, 6034 speaks to accessory residential buildings, six meters from all property lines, and that's the imaginary lines within the development. <clears throat> that's been amended by two different development variance permits, and I believe it's down to three meters. Um, so really it's a variance from three to three meters to 2.3 meters. Um, staff's recommending that, uh, that it be issued. Um, the, the fire department does have some concerns. Again, um, just as you add more of these structures, it's gonna be harder and harder to get fire equipment in and around this building. So, you know, when this, this property's finally built out with a, go to the next slide, you can see there's already a, a little structure there. Um, you can see if the, you know, and the person on the other side builds to the same and there's an RV parked at the back, um, the deck on that side, you know, this multiplies over the, the entire parcel and there's a fire, it's gonna be very hard to get fire equipment or even uh, firefighters um, in there to fight the fire. So the fire chief's recommending that you, um, and you know, everything stick to the original variances um, at the, when the park was developed. So um, the deck is where the car is now? The deck would be where the car is. Okay, yep. And then so the- So the remainder up that would be the carport. So, oh, so okay. The, the carport- the is, Sorry, the deck is on the side where the between the two steps. So. Oh, sorry, that's what I meant when I said the car there. So I guess there's one way back there too, sorry. Yeah, that one, that car. No, all good. Then yeah, the carport would be on this side. So uh, I just like to make a comment. We varied this thing to make it that it was going to be standardized at the three meters. Craig's still working with the five and six meters, but that's what the sorting bylaw is. But we we agreed so that everybody could have that extra three extra space that we would go with the three meters. But I see you have your car parked there, so. Now your car and your deck, like that's the roadway, right? That's not supposed to be the way it's supposed to work. Is that correct, Greg? They're not, are they parking on the street there? Is that allowed? Yeah, they park on the back one side. Yes, yes, that okay. And back one side. My other issue is, is that I was there and I, I looked down the place that we allowed to have a deck that had already been built and we gave them a variance. And I said at the time, this is just going to snowball everybody will come and say they want the same thing. So in the future, you're gonna to have to make sure you place your unit so that they want that eight foot deck. They can have an eight foot deck and beat the three meter setback or whatever it is off a road. It's less off of the interior side of it. Right. So uh, and then when I look at that existing one with the deck on it, yours is actually two feet towards the road more than that one is. And I didn't have a tape measure, so I don't know how wide his deck was. So we only gave them a 2.3 meter variant, or no. 2.96, was We gave them 1.96. Yeah, a greater variance. We gave them a greater variance and I'm just, if you put an eight foot deck in there, I don't know if you 
Do you actually have like property pits, Craig? Or we don't have property pits. I didn't think you did, but so imaginary. Yeah. So does that imaginary line move, or is it supposed to be fixed? Well, you should. You know, you have engineer drawings that have imaginary property lines. You know, are relatively accurate, but they're not legal accurate. You know, so you know you can look at edge of pavement, which is you know, pretty good guideline. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say so, I because I think where we're coming from here is is. Diane's deck going to be closer to the pavement than the other, or closer to the line than the other deck was. Not according to uh, and not I asked for the yes. period, or that's why I asked all, the other one. Smaller deck or a not as wide deck? I don't know. Okay. Uh, so the first question, like the, the imaginary lines, were are basing those on the development permit that was issued that shows the property lines. So as they make applications, Greg gets Franklin to update the drawing and then we can and we're using that that franklin engineering drawing from the, the development permit so this will be this deck will be 40 centimeters smaller or further from the setback than the previous one okay All right so but again we changed everything to be three meters on the on a roadside or not interior side and so if it's possible, if you're gonna build stuff and you get it located, so because uh, how wide is your concrete pad there? Is it the concrete? That's 12 or 15 feet. Yeah. So that, that's all I was saying. Yeah, I know where the fence is. So not not that it makes any difference to me, it's just the location of the unit. If you know what you're going to put on it, we have the final or the what they call this things put underneath the cement for the posts to sit on. Yeah, that's been into the piles. Uh, yeah, but the the issue is is that when they're put in, they should know what you're going to do, so that they can step that, so that you you don't have to come for a variance. That. We're trying to get away from that as much. That's why we went down to the three meters on the roadside as opposed to, I think it was five meters, wasn't it? We set it up the same as parking, didn't we, basically? What's your question? Well, the setbacks, we set that up the same as, because they're the same size lots, 0.11. I don't know. I don't so, anyway. Um, and then what's the lot? The lot coverage is you got 2,000 square feet with your deck building and carport. And this is where I got confused. If you use the 35 meters or whatever it is, the metric version, and you convert that, that's 4,500 square feet. And if you use the 0.11 of an acre, it's 4,790 square feet. So I'm not sure. But that's 200 makes a big difference but what what are we allowing 40 percent or it's 40 percent for the whole property so the entire oh so not an individual and we've been we've been looking at it you know at 40 percent for each lot as well that's kind of how we're interpreting it yeah. and this is below the 40 percent yeah okay any other comments no i i think the um, as far as a, having one um, one building on on these, uh, like I said before, the uh, it's reasonable. I think it's reasonable to have a carport and a deck for sure. So that would be two. So that that you know, I think that's a kind of a no brainer. Everybody's going to want to have a carport. And everybody's going to want to have a deck, and uh, it you know to have to keep coming back to to make a decision on that seems silly, but the uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah, that's how I feel about that part of it. Okay, so uh, the question is, is the uh, recommendation, which I've read, that the, the Planning and Development Committee recommend the district issue the development variance permit as requested for 2.3 meters? All in favor? Yeah. Chair. Good to go, Dad. 
Thanks, Greg. Okay. All right. Five B Paradise. Five B. New five B. We have a new five. No five B. Isn't it paradise? No, because you added. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, comments about. Um, I guess what I'd like to know is, if you go over to the headlocks and you build a house, you need a building permit. If you go across the channel and you build a house, you need a development permit. Why? Like if there was a house there already. And there was no house over there, but I want to build a house. I don't need a building permit. I don't need a developer permit. Why, if you're building a house on the other side of the channel, do you need a development permit as opposed to just a building permit? If they're on the water. Well, they're not on the water. It's the, the repair and areas regulations say any development within 30 meters of the water requires a development permit. So you want to. Cut a tree down, build your retaining wall, build the house. You need a, a development partner from council. So 30 meters from the I water. So uh, if, and we talked about this the other day um, with, uh, with, with one of the projects there. So if you're above 30 meters, then it doesn't, it doesn't trigger the the development permit correct um, and we are so when a project goes through and they get a QEP to um, to come in and uh, and and do an assessment so that you can build below like inside of that thirty meter then that doesn't affect uh, that doesn't affect anything it's it's back to that 30 meter no matter what is that am i reading that right yeah it's it's a very clear and and almost arbitrary line it's like any development within that 30 meters so if if someone had a lot and they built outside 30 meters they wouldn't need a development permit but if they put you know one centimeter inside that 30 meters they they would need a development permit that triggers the RAR the whole correct and and so when you get a development permit then that's where you have to do the references to you know just go the 50 meters outside the box oh no so the development permit um you need to hire a what our bylaw requires is that you have to hire a qep to, to assess where the stream side protection enhancement area is and then they have to you know say this building is going to be not going to negatively affect fish habitat. They submit it to the province. The province reviews it, it approves it, and then you can go forward. Usually, they come up with a setback between thirty meters and fifteen meters. Yeah, appropriate. Um, and then, and then you can build within that according to the the plan that's been accepted by the province. So, what is the referral portion of it? Uh, we refer out to um essentially internally and then we refer to first nations as well okay although it's private lab but is, is that part of the rule or is that another sick of those rule um i think we can we can choose who we prefer it out to um i don't believe in our procedures it's it's nailed down, um, but we you know, think that an area of sensitivity, we'll say, the channel is an area of sensitivity. I think it's important that we refer out to, to our partners there. Okay. I'm just asking the questions for clarity, and I wanted it in a public meeting yep. so that people that develop over there don't start down the road saying, I'll get a building permit. Uh, this is what I got to do. They'll know what the rules are out of the gate so that when they're talking as a builder to somebody, they can say to them, okay, we need a, uh, uh, not a building permit, we need a development permit, which is two different things, but the cost is 
could be hugely different. Yeah. That was the purpose of this. Yeah, for sure. And we should note that on our map. Somehow, it should be noted someplace that if you're building within 30 meters, because anybody on this side of the channel that's doing the same thing within the 30 meters is going to require the same rule. Uh, and we have <laughs> people making applications now on, on Merrill Lake. And um, I mean, if it is, and it's any creek in town, so, yeah. you know, some, some properties are on creeks and other things. So, yeah. So we need to make that a very clear statement so that they don't come in with the idea of building permit versus development permit. So it's just information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other comment? Go ahead, Gore. Sir, I'm late. I had a lithium battery uh, blow up. <laughs> so, oh. Sorry, I texted you. <laughs> Um, did I miss anything? Like, we're everything, everybody okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we moved, we moved 5E to 5A. Okay. All right. So we've already dealt with that, which was the Hillier Road. Okay. Okay. Any other comments regarding the DP building permit? No. Yeah. So if there's some way that we can get that, noted i yeah i think it's i think where the confusion lies sometimes is when it wasn't required in the past and is required now then that could be uh confusing but uh yeah it's good to get that clarification here and uh everybody can go forward and, and i just have one other comment well i could make it later when we get to it but the, the referral agents in there was listed as flats but the Rail Trail Technical Advisory Committee. Why would we refer to them? They're the adjacent property owner, and uh, we're trying to build relationships there. They're one of our partners. So we want to keep working with them. Okay, no. that's good. Good luck with that. All right. So five B was the discussion DP building permit. So now five C is the previous 5A. 5B. Oh yeah, fine. you're right. Oh, no. <laughs> We're confused here, Orville. So I'm just gonna make this B. Oh, it doesn't let me write on that side. Huh. Heard something. Okay, so covenant removal, 1127 Paradise. So, uh, Planning and Development Committee recommend the council to authorize the removal of covenant number KR23112 for the property legally described as Lot 1, District Lot 497, Kamloops Division, Yale District, Plan KAP68588, except Plan KAP88791, located at 1127 Paradise. Who's the lead on this? Sarah, go ahead. Hey, um, so this property recently changed hands from what I understand. Um, and I believe these folks did come and make a brief presentation at one of our PDCs earlier this year about um, what the new owners would like to do with this property. Uh, so it's just kind of in behind the ambulance station next to our trail access to the crosswalk across um, 97A. So this property currently has a covenant on it uh, for highway reserve, which was for the Ministry of Transportation, some older plans that are no longer current for the roundabout to be there. Uh, so we did send this request to MOTI through their EDAS system and they responded saying, yep, they would support removal of this covenant. Um, because the district is a signatory to this covenant, the district also needs to sign off on this. Uh, so the request is to remove this covenant that's shown in the dark outline on the corner of this property. The plan for this covenant area is a little older, so it doesn't show where the ambulance station parcel is. So it's actually a panhandle access. And what the new owners would like to do is a townhouse development 
some components to provide um, worker house. <clears throat> and that, that would require a zoning amendment. Okay. But this is the first step is to establish where their actual buildable area is on the property so they can start preparing yeah. plans. So and that, you got the letter from MOTI, so it's good. Yep. Uh, did you want to excuse yourself or not vote? Or? No, no, I can not not the landowner, so okay. I'm fine. All right, then I'll call the question. All in favor? Good. All right. Uh, 5CD, uh, 419B Old Spala Machine Road. Um, recommendation that one? Very. We already did that one, right? We did. No, we, nope. we had a discussion about. Oh, oh, I see. Got it. That the Planning and Development Committee recommend the Council authorize the issue development permit number 22-247-DP for the property legally described with Lot 1, Section 36, Township 21, Range 8, West of the 6th Meridian, Kamloops Division, Yale District Plan, EPP 55454, located at 419B Old Fall Machine Road to permit the development of a single-family resident dwelling and retaining wall. Who has the Sarah? Go ahead. Okay. So, so the property is located on Old Small Machine Road, just up from the turnoff down into Coach. Uh, it's designated low density residential. It abuts the uh, transportation corridor designation, the rail trail uh, across from the channel drop permit area. It's zoned R1 and 2 residential. Next slide. The proposal is to build a new dwelling unit on the subject property. It's largely outside of the development permit area, which is 30 meters, and it is upland of the SIA, so the area. A portion of the deck, which you can see in the lower corner here, is deck and patio slash deck, depending on where the finish grade is that projects a little bit into the development permit area. So this is what's triggering the development permit requirement. The streamside protection enhancement area is mostly off the property within the rail corridor, but it does cross into the subject property. Um, there are plans to put in some retaining works here. Uh, it would be like a, a stacked rock wall as opposed to like a solid, or cement retaining wall, so it'll be a little more natural, and it will be upland of the SPIA. The QEP has provided recommendations for stormwater management, sediment erosion control during construction to ensure that there's no runoff entering into the SPIA on the rail trip. So, yeah, and I mean, there isn't a lot of opportunity potentially really to move the house completely out of the development permit area because there is an access easement along the fronts of these properties because of the slope. Okay, any comments? All in favor? It's carried. Uh, five. E twenty two one two eight dash DP five ten tops in place. Planning and Development Committee recommended council authorize an issue of development permit for two two dash one two eight dash DP for the property legally described as lot B section one township twenty two. Range 8 west of the 6th Meridian Cab Loops Division, Yale District Plan, EPP 89682, located at 510 Thompson Place to permit the development of a biomass and district heating system. Who has this? Sarah? <laughs> okay. So the subject property is located off of Sycamore Soulslaw Road, just before it turns into Old Town Road. Uh, on Thompson Place. It's designated General Industrial in the official community plan zoned I1A under the zoning bylaw. Uh, so the proposal for this, 
unfortunately, it looks like our images aren't working. We have a software issue. Um, so it'll be a smaller industrial building with two bay doors, one large bay door, one smaller bay door. There'll be a couple man doors. Okay, you can see it better once it's not in that. So you can see what uh, it'll look like. And then we've got a proposal here for landscaping, but basically the exterior will be dark brown in line with our, our branding colors. <laughs> and the doors would be like a sand or taupe color. Though they could be, it could be different, it could be white. <laughs> the roof would be similar, a dark color to avoid glare. Uh, and it's metal siding. We'll have one access that would be suitable for large uh, commercial vehicles to come in and out to drop off the biomass, which would be wood chips. So we'll be backing into the building. There'll be a walking floor in there. So the load will be unloaded onto it and the walking floor will empty it into a storage chamber down below. Um, and then it will enter a boiler and that would be how it produces heat. Landscaping, there is a utility the right of way impacting the property, which has affected siting of the building, as well as um, you know where landscaping can go. There are utility boxes that are located on the property. You set right of way. So the landscaping has been set up to provide some screening consistent with what other properties in the area have already done for their development permits. Um, that respects where that infrastructure is so that it doesn't tangle with it. So three larger trees, red maples, some yew along the back for screening, and then some shrubs to jazz it up a little bit. Largely zero escaped. No turf that could catch fire. <laughs> So I have a couple of comments, questions. Um, first off, when you have to put the landscaping in over there, so for example, uh, Walmart, they put in the uh, shrubs, but they're all dead. Yeah. So I have. So, so what? What? No. What is the timeline? Like, if you go up and you cut down the forest on the hill. You gotta replant it at a certain amount of time, and after a certain amount of years, seventy percent of it has to still be there. If you got less than that, then you gotta replant. So, exactly how are we controlling this expense that <clears throat> last? And we mentioned three or four times in this meeting about doing something at the entrance and having it that it's maintained so that it actually lives and forget about using up land space within a industrial park. So first question is, when they put it in, so they put it in, they get their 125% hold back on the landscaping back, but it dies in six months or it dies in a year. What is the timeline that it must survive for? So how it works, and it is written into some of the development permits, um, it's outlined in our official community plan process for that. So once it goes in, they're supposed to call for an inspection by staff. So we can verify, yep, put it in, you've checked off this development permit condition because the permit itself is only good for two years if you don't substantially complete, right? So part of documenting substantial completion is this landscape inspection. Um, so depending on who installs it, ideally the installer will provide a letter saying, hey, I put this in on the state, and then the installer can either contact with us, connect with us or the agent on the project can submit that to us and say, hey, it's in, the installer says it's all done and it's good, come and confirm. So staff would go out, be like, yeah, it's in, and now starts your maintenance period. So maintenance period is typically one to two years um, when larger trees are involved, typically two years um, to make sure that they're watered so that they become drought tolerant. Uh, so that's when that starts. And then, you know, they can ask for at that point, if it's good, the insulation looks good. And hypothetically, it, as long as it's maintained, watered, heated, it should survive. 
they can request a partial return of the security. So we take the 125%, but we don't keep all of it. It's partially refunded once it's put in. And then the rest is held for the maintenance period, whatever we stated in our development permit, a year or two years. So once that time is up, they ideally go and correct any deficiencies that they already know about, right? Any plants that didn't make it, replace them, pull the weeds, call for an inspection by the district. And typically that would also be supported by a letter from their installer or their landscape architect, right? Saying, you know, we've gone out, we've checked, we noted these deficiencies. This is what I recommended. They are now installed. Please come and, and confirm. So once we go and we confirm, yeah, everything looks good, it still meets the development permit, then we release the final amount of security. If not, we continue to hold it and work with them to get the deficiencies corrected. Typically, it's pulling weeds and replacing any plants that didn't make it. So how much of that? So if it was a $10,000 job, they got to put up 12500 we usually return 80% the, at the first refund. So, and then the next, we refund the balance plus interest. So then basically you're giving them the cost back and you're holding that 25% almost. Like I said, I personally in an industrial area, I understand we were all part of the, three of us were all part of the OCP when it was created. Um, I don't remember discussing an industrial park having any of that stuff in it. So however that got added into the OCP, I don't know where they pulled that out of. Uh, industrial property, like I owned industrial property in Calgary. And the last thing you want to do is take up the expensive cost of real estate and use it to put trees in. If you're parking trucks in there, you're storing steel, or you're doing whatever you're doing, that land you purchased to do that work with, not give up six feet around your property to put trees in. So I understand we call it a beautification, uh, but it has been mentioned four or five times about something at the entrance, whatever we call that, the Sick Moose Industrial Park or whatever industrial park you want to call it and having some sort of a gate because it's the only road and it's highly unlikely that we'll see much more of an industrial park in six months. So, but it's also going to be the entrance, I'm assuming, to the affordable housing that was attached to that ALR property that was let out of the ALR. There's three, two or four acres there at the back behind those. For uh, attainable housing, I guess is the word we're looking for. So, you know, the maintenance of the trees, especially cedars. I put cedars in on the front, on the highway in front of my place, and they're there six years and four died. They were only four feet high when I put them in, and four of the nine footers died this year. Why I don't know. For actually you, because because cedars are not as drought hardy, they're they're cheap to buy and put in, but they're not really a, an ideal plant for sick moose. So we did consult a, a local nursery when we got our quotes, and they recommended you instead. Um, and you don't need as many to fill the same screen, the same space, and they won't yeah. need. Like once we've got them drought tolerant after the first couple of years of watering, they should be okay, except for unusual years when they're not out. We need to water them. It's the same story with these trees. Um, so tree bags can be put on those. It would be filled every couple of days with water, and they're just slowly oh, double oh, deep watering. And they would need those for the first couple of years, and after that, <laughs> same kind of story. Um, but yeah, like it's not. It's not really the OCP that has the screening requirement yeah. for industrial land. It's the zoning bylaw that does. It has a screening requirement for these ugly industrial spaces like storage yards. There's a full screening requirement, right? And then there's like a buffering requirement, which would be like a depth of a bed that kind of creates space, sound, and light barrier, right? And when it comes to something like an ALR, a buffer on ALR is a barrier for noxious odors, like when someone's spraying poop to fertilize, right? <laughs> uh, well, good luck with that. 
That, that's what that's about, right? <clears throat> Any other comments? Sure. Yeah, see that you're, uh, you know, I, I agree with Jeff. Um, you know, it's just, it doesn't make sense in an industrial park. I mean, it is nice, but to make them put in trees and, and not water them, I mean, nine times out of 10, they're not gonna survive in an industrial park. They just don't. And that's just evident of what happened at, at uh, um, uh, Walmart. I think probably Howard's property could be an exception because he's there all the time and he's watering and his trees are kind of grown. But if he wasn't, yeah, and if you're not, you know, if you're not there, it they ain't gonna grow. So that's why I've always said, and Jeff, you know, my part, this committee kind of agrees, get everybody to throw in five hundred dollars and do the do a industrial park sign and do a really nice entrance to it, and uh, and call it a day because an industrial park is an industrial park, and uh, there's gonna be fiberglass and welding and and that kind of stuff going on and trucks and. It's just, it just doesn't have to be beautiful, but the entrance should be nice. And our entrance looks terrible, and the rest of the park looks terrible now because the cedars are all dying. I just, you know, it's something that we have to look for when we get into our zoning, and hopefully we'll change that when we get our final draft that we won't have landscaping in there. That kind of landscaping. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Ahead, sure. Um, so just wanted to address because Walmart keeps coming up. They are still in progress. They haven't had their first inspection yet. So I have been in, in contact with the agent um, and they do have another development permit that they're working on for their storage. They, they put in a storage container that's for like windshield washer fluid, all these kind of things. Um, but they do, they, they are aware of that. And so in the fall, my understanding is they'll be replacing the dead plants, calling for their inspection, and then we'll start the maintenance period. So, and I will work with them on, for example, tree bags, because that's the simplest thing. <laughs> we'll see what happens. It's... Brian? <laughs> so, where, uh, where the industrial park borders a country residential property, I get it 100%, mm -hmm. um, having some sort of screening, so, like, and which is, which is required in this, in, in this place. But I totally agree, and I and and I think that 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 you could ask eighty percent of the people in this town, and 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 I'm a tree guy. I love I I love to see trees at the uh, you know there's a place on Main Street or there's you know a, a, a fronted road and there's a, a commercial space. I think it's got to look good. We've got to, it's a great place to grow things. But in here, I totally agree with. With you, you too. It just, it just, it doesn't make sense. It just seems like an added cost that that we don't need. Need and putting it at the front of the uh, the the entrance, it 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 makes perfect sense. So I, yeah, that's. Go ahead, sir. You chair. Um. So just to let everybody know. I did recently look at our landscape requirements in our new zoning bylaw, and they are not specifically triggered. So right now, our current zoning bylaw, it says industrial zones, commercial zones. These are the landscape requirements. So that's where this part came from, is from our current regulations. So the new proposed ones, they're in our general regulations, but they are not specifically tied to a zone or a trigger. It's up to, it's up to us to reference those in a zone in terms of regulating. So there are some zones in the new bylaw where that would be triggered. So we could talk about for third reading, taking them out and just leaving it to the development permit process, for example. But we could also add in, if you wanted, a change specifically for industrial parks where it's just the outside of the park at the entrance and interface areas, because we do, it is a big issue, interface areas between different uses. Sure, for sure. Actually, like with light and noise, it's come up a few times in, in recent time, like yeah. Shell, for example, um, that those kind of uses are buffered, like distance enough from residential properties, and that there's some screening in place to deal with light, because a fence can only be so tall, a fence can only do so much, and then, it's trees that don't have a height restriction or plants providing that screening. So is your I just want to say I hear what you're saying and I'm curious like what would what would you want to do? So the so the new zoning bylaw meets 
what the OCP has in it, where it's not stipulating you have to have this stuff. So this 1993 zoning bylaw is the one that's talking about the trees and the plants. Specifically for industrial zones, yes. And some of the zones in the new bylaw will reference those landscape regs, right? So, so we might want to look at the industrial zone and see what it's saying. So why did we not, because we, we've been trying to get some things that made common sense, like for the Mobile Hole Park and for uh, the Parks View property and, and the things that we're doing, we're, we're trying to go, well, we'll reference the new zoning bylaw, make that the one we're going to kind of try and follow as opposed to following the old one, which, you know, it's seven years and the bank could get this. So by the time we're done with it, it's going to need to be revisited again. So, like, it, it would just save uh, a bunch of aggravation and time because most if, if it becomes a discretionary thing, like in an industrial park, I've been in lots of them. There's you don't find that land is too expensive to be given it up for. You, you bought two acres or whatever size you bought because you have a use for it. But when you got to give up any part of it for vegetation. And I mean, there's a lot of places just out of the simple of their own thing, you know, they, they'll put a, they'll put some plants at the front of it if they got to build it or whatever. But so far, we may have a couple of buildings and we, the district, will be the probably first building built. The sh shades might get up before us, but the rest of them are an Atco trailer, a uh, sea camp. So, I mean, go ahead, sir. Well, there's a couple ways it can be done. Like it doesn't, it doesn't have to be on the property in terms of just in response to that comment, right? It can be, it can be an offsite improvement, which is what I'm not trying to open a can of worms here, which is what we did with the proposed gas station on Main Street by the roundabout. So instead of them using up the property for that, they're providing a contribution to the roundabout landscaping, right? Improving our pedestrian environment and, and the gateway to the community. So there, there's options there. It can be done that way, right? Um, but this particular property, I will stop. Just so that you know why, this is a district property. There are other properties in that industrial subdivision that have met our zoning. Because it's a district property, it should probably be consistent with the other property. So you don't think it would be appropriate to, at this point, to have a conversation with those other properties and say, oh, look, the district just chose to put a, a nice entrance in, and we would, rather than you redoing the trees and doing this, you contribute to that. And is there a way that we could actually do that and then get that done? That the Because look, you have a utility right away. What you think is twin acre sewer line, isn't it? It is sewer, yeah. I think there might be water in there too. So anyway, why, why could we not do that and be the district, whatever money we're spending on this here, put it in there. And you're going to need another buffer if that development goes for the housing behind that. Because that's the straight part of the road going in. That's where it's getting to is that part. So just something to think about. Should we look into it and come back? <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to, I mean, you need, you need this approved to get them started to build. Yeah, this one, but as far as your idea about big, I, I like an entrance treatment, right? There well, it would be, it would be worthwhile to, to ask the people that are out there if they would rather contribute to that as opposed to doing whatever they're doing, shade, the other one. If if they got to replant trees again, they already got another cost coming at them uh, for the Walmart property. Uh, I don't know that they did anything, but I don't know why they would want to contribute to it. So it would be worthwhile asking. Go ahead, Deb. Yeah, I'm just gonna say, if, it, as as a property owner, <laughs> you know that has, does a lot of, of you know planting and whatever. If we're thinking that we really do want to position this as part of the new zoning bylaw and, and what we're dealing with the industrial, we should ask them now before they replant and yeah. replant. And, yeah. You know, that's, that's all I'm saying is, this, if you went there, there's nothing drawn up, there's nothing carved in stone. Just said, look, it's been discussed about having an eight that 
entrance way that's going to have you know some trees and this or whatever it is that we want to do to give it that curb appeal so to speak and then you know it's 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 not going to hide the industrial park by any stretch of the imagination because you can't go all the way down to the railroad tracks in front of a and the other property is not sold yet so that's just something that staff could possibly make an inquiry into and see if there's any legs to it. If there's no legs to it, if the, if the business owners that exist there today and, and Shane and them say, no, we're fine with putting in our own stuff again, then so be it. But that doesn't get us a veteran side. Go ahead, Gordon. Yeah, Jeff, I agree. I, I really think, you know, sir, and I don't, you know, the bag thing, I don't know, and it might be easy to put the bag on, but just imagine poor person. And these aren't residents. People don't live there 24 hours. So nobody going to come in in the evening and fill the bags. They're not going to get filled. It'll be another head seater there in no time. So it's either automatic watering system or forget it because it's a, it's, he lives there 24 hours. Come in the evening, fill the bags or they probably won't fill them in the daytime. So I, I do agree that we should, you know, really seriously take a look. And I know this is a, the district of Sikkim, which is, is the property, but a serious talk with the owners and say, you know, maybe instead of, because how many trees? They got 100 trees there? <laughs> that's a lot of bags. Uh, that's a lot of trees to replace because almost everyone's dead. Um, maybe it's wise to make that conversation now before Shane gets too far into it. And uh, everybody else gets too part into that subdivision. I think Walmart is the only one with any substantial landscaping. The other properties, it's like five shrubs and a tree. Like Shane's is like five shrubs, and the other fellow is a tree and three shrubs. Like it's it's really negligible comparatively speaking. And I think if we went to Ames and told told them what we're doing, I, I'm sure they would kick in. I'm sure they would kick in because they didn't do anything. You know, we didn't make them do anything. They were supposed to do. It is what it is at this point, but they were supposed to. Anyway, let's go back to this. Uh, so I've, uh, I know I haven't read the, did I read the, I did read the uh, recommendation. So, I think that for the building to start, the, the landscape thing is something that can be discussed if staff would mind. I, I think that we should probably have to do this, this thing could get built. So I'm going to call a question all in favor. Carried. Okay. But if staff would mind just like a general inquiry to the people with the tree out there and say, hey, would you be more inclined to contribute to a a nicer entrance into the place as opposed to the landscape. And they may say they'll do both. Like, I don't know. So, okay. Um, this is G, I guess now. So 22-170-EVP-222 Temple Street. So the Planning and Development Committee recommend to the District of Sigamus an issue of various development permit number 22-170-DVP to vary Sigamus subdivision and development service of bylaw number 500, 2003 sections 501, 5.02, 5.03, 5.04, 5.05, 5.06, 5.07, service and requirements were closed lot one and allow for a parcel two subdivision. Um, who's the lead on this? You are, Scott? This is a property that this committee has seen before and went to council to, to rezone the property. So lot two was rezoned to R1, R2 to allow for a, a single family dwelling and uh, to move towards a subdivision. Uh, we received a subdivision application and a preliminary layout review was provided. That 
layout review has the conditions of subdivision, all the requirements in order to, to subdivide. <clears throat> so in this particular case, it would require um, road upgrades along uh, Temple plus the, the other services. Um, so this application is to defer the um, those upgrades for the proposed lot too. So imagine you know the cost of providing the the sidewalk and uh, and other services. Um, <clears throat> so this is to defer that until the proposed lot two is actually uh, we receive a building permit or development permit for that. And uh, and that would be through a, a covenant that would say there'd be essentially a no development covenant on the proposed lot two until those things are provided. And so those things that would be deferred are the road cross, cross section of the sidewalk. So we have that, that standard the road is uh, to be built to, um, that'd be including overhead street lighting, and then the electrical and communications, so BC Hydro, and then the new water and new sewer services that would be provided, and then drainage, so storm drainage, so plan to address it on site or connect to the, the system. Um, so this would apply just to that lot too. Um, a lot of this um, probably is not going to be like the, the proposed just move forward with a single family dwelling on lot one. So um, probably it does make sense to uh, to require the construction of a sidewalk on that post lot lot one. Although we'd probably take cash in lieu um, for that portion just to ensure that it would get done in the future. And uh, yeah, staff's recommending that uh, this development variance permit be issued. Um, it would come to council. Um, I did attach the subdivision engineering report um, that uh, Jeremy had provided. So that gives more detail of, of what is required. Um, but yeah, in general terms, it's a deferral of the requirements um, for that larger lot two. Oh, I'm here. here. Lot one, sorry. And yeah, Howard, Howard is, is here. I called him early this morning, let him know that uh, he's welcome to that. Okay. Um, so I'm going to call that. Um, you know, we, we, uh, we allowed this subdivision. And the idea that something was going to happen towards get the R5 and a housing thing. And I, I don't know if you're trying to sell it or you're looking for a partner, but we allowed that because the way it was presented to us, this townhouse thing was going to happen sooner or later. If you could have your one acre lot. And so now we're going to give you some more stuff. I don't see anything on that lot one. I, I haven't I heard have about lot one because we've got is all part of one title lot right now. So in terms of getting someone even interested, I have to split those two, go through the official subdivision process first. I am actually meeting with people continually. The challenge has been I want the house built first. That was the plan that I proposed to council when we started this a couple of years ago. And I still can't find anyone that wants to build a house. So things are moving, albeit extremely slowly. So it is moving ahead. But if you make me build the sidewalk in front of lot two as I develop that, that's just going to be where my house is, which doesn't make any sense to me. It makes more sense to say, well, as Scott said, if we have to put a covenant on lot one to say that has to be included, that's fine. It's going to get done. I just don't want it to be done piecemeal. I'd rather have it all done at once. And I think the town has some work to do to figure out what's going to happen with the rest of the street. Are we just widening the roadway and I'm losing that property? Or is everyone else along there going to put in sidewalk as well? So there's, there's more to this than just me. Well, like I said, we really needed the house again. And maybe I missed that part about you were building your house first. I thought it was if you got your lot subdivided off, that that other side of your house might be a simultaneous project. And now you're saying it's not till after the house is built. So we could be years, a long time before the housing that was designated like that was rezoned purposely to create housing and if there's someone that you have that wants to join project with me to build that housing today i'll meet with them right now i'm ready to go and i've been for some time okay is there another part to this application as well is there a, a request for a variance on setbacks there, there's no request for variance on setbacks 
Where do we read that? I thought it was in there somewhere. Because that's what we asked. We said, we haven't even seen a dry or a house or anything else. And he's got almost an acre of land and he wants a variance on setbacks. Like, I think that's. That's the. It, uh, I think that I saw something in that package about um, a variance, of, a setback variance in there. So maybe it just got stuck into that file accidentally in our in our package. But if there's no setback variance asked for, then we've we've got a half acre for our primary residence. Yeah, but there should be no setback. Variance required, like that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I don't know where we saw that at because that was the first question. Like, we haven't even seen what you're trying to build yet, and we have, we're being asked for setback variance. So, no, nope, sounds like we haven't. So, so that's not a part of it. So, uh, what are you proposing, Scott? Uh, clearly, you're how do we make sure that? The sidewalk and the street lamps, the rest of it remains an obligation of the gentleman here. Like, and, and is there going to be a timeline on it? Like, because if it takes 20 years to sell the property, like, you know, it's just, we keep doing cash in lieu is not a good idea. Because in 10 years, it might not buy the light bulb for the street lamp. So you have to come up with a different way of making it. A, He's going to be responsible, and we're not taking a hundred dollars a day, so it costs a thousand dollars, whatever it happens. So, for um, the larger lot, it would be deferred until a development, a development permit or a, a building permit, and uh, and we do that through covenant. So, clear would be on title, and then you know, if that's on that larger lot, but what about lot one? Lot one, we'd require cash in lieu for lot one for the road improvements. So that would be payable right away at the time of subdivision. Yeah, but then we're not doing the work. We, well, it's essentially a, a decision of operations department, you know, to decide. Why would they do the work without the development permit on the big lot for one residence? That's not gonna happen. Correct. It, it's unlikely that they would do it, but it's, it's really, it's up to the, the operations department to dis determine if they'd accept cash and lieu for the work. Um, in this case, it probably would make more sense to take cash and lieu because to mobilize for a you know very short sidewalk doesn't make any sense at this time. So, uh, I, I like I said, we we did this with a few developments in this community, and we sat on two or three hundred thousand dollars. For 10 years. And now that intersection is going to cost $2 billion. And, and I, I don't want the taxpayer to put the bill because we took cash in lieu on something that might not happen for five years. The, the, the separation of the property and the obligation to do the work is either do it now or be committed that that property has something, a covenant on its title that when it happens, they're going to be responsible for the full cost, not give us some cash in lieu today and in five years we end up with whatever the cost is because nothing costs the same in five years. So if, if that's what the committee wants to recommend that that to change this variance to include to vary everything until it's uh, to defer everything until that larger lot is developed then we can then not require the cash in lieu and Required the full cost that other lots developed. Oh, that's why I say you know that it's it's all time orientated. If somebody was going to develop that next week, or there was a guy came in and said he was doing it, well, then as the you would pay his portion based on that. But we don't know that property's been looked like that for ten years now. So I, I'm not I I don't have a crystal ball that says that it's going to move forward in the near future. All right, so um, I, I guess I'd be curious to know what the cash in lieu amount is going to be. So, you know, if 
if you take a look at anything that we've ever done, the bridge, the this, the every job we've ever done, those sidewalks on shoe swap that came in at, at six hundred or seven hundred thousand dollars, and it costs us generally twenty to thirty percent more by the time we get to build it. And that's within a two year time space. So I don't know how you calculate the escalation of might happen, might never happen. That's that's all I'm saying. And I don't think that the district is sick of those taxpayers should be overall obligated to pay for something that's part of a development program. But I've seen where, you know, at this stage, even like at the variant stage when it comes to council, they get an opinion probable cost from an engineer saying it's going to cost this amount of money. And then council sees the dollar value that they're either varying completely or deferring. So that's, we, we could ask for that. I, I think as for that opinion of probable cost now for a very short section, you know, it, it does make a lot of sense uh, for that short section, but it, I would say it would probably be fiscally responsible of council to defer everything until it's ready to be constructed instead of accepting cash in lieu at twenty twenty two dollars when in twenty twenty four it could be fifteen, twenty, hundred, fifty percent higher. And we don't want it looking like it looks in front of powder like a hundred feet of sidewalk with street lab and nothing for a million miles. So I don't care how you want to word it, but I want to make sure that that property, whatever that cost is going to be is being borne by the property owner. Do you want so in your recommendation, do you want to say to cover all of the street frontage and to vary that? Well, to 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 make it a covenant on the whole thing attached to lot one. Just because that's the only way that we're gonna ensure how you could build a nice place and in five years you decide you're gonna sell it. So we have to have something in place that stays on title with that piece of property that it is part of the obligation for those services. So I don't know if you want to just verbally reword this or do you want to bring it back? I recommend that the committee have their recommendation on the condition that it includes um, proposed lot one and two. Okay, Gord. Just a quick one, Scott. Does uh, 219 covenant does it have a time limit on it? Though you could, I know the property we had had 25 years on it, but I don't know why it was 25 years. To, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm just curious because I know we did the same. We had the same problem with Sam at Sable Developments, and uh, and he had cash in lieu of, and then we have Wayfine Crescent. They had cash in lieu of for their sidewalk, and it never got done, and you know. They're probably under by five, six hundred thousand dollars now compared to when it was before. So, but yeah, no, I recommend we do a two nineteen covenant for sure. It would work. It's easy. It's you know, it's uh, we just get it, you know, get it done. So it's not saying in here. Uh, what would be the wording? You're you're doing a variance for lot one to allow lot two parcel subdivision. So it was it hasn't been subdivided yet. No. So I'd say for proposed lots one and two, and we can amend the I mean, your recommendation is kind of more of an instruction for us that we can bring to council. So I I, I understand what you're saying. In your recommendation, you'd say, you know, um, and to include proposed lot two, the the upgrades required for proposed lot two, and I think that's clear enough. For okay, this. so we'll amend it to read that uh, the services requirements proposed for lot one and lot two parcel subdivision. That's all we need to do. Yep. Okay. In favor of that amendment? You good with that? Yeah, just so we're clear. I'm just trying to get this done. I'm not trying to shirk anything. No. Nope. If you want to develop lot one. But the plan was always develop, build the house first, and then tackle law one. That's been my intention. I've been open and honest with everyone on council all the way through to say there's no hidden agenda here. This is exactly what's going on. So I'm not trying to shirk anything or defer anything to put it on the taxpayer of the town. I'm going to get it done. It just doesn't make sense. 
because and honestly, I was trying to get a builder to build the house this year, but none of the builders want to build houses. So, you know, we got pushed back a year, but now it's the time actually we've got to get moving on this. Like my wife is mad, but we're not done. So what she wants that, is going to happen for sure. That's more important than us being mad. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that's not when we got elected quite a few years ago. We went through our bank account and we had a lot of money in our bank account. And our bank account was a lot of cash in lieu. And a lot of that cash in lieu was sitting there for projects that had never been done, not even started. And so 25 years later, there's still the obligation to do this work with the $3 that you have on the $100 cost. And we, we absolved all those things and fixed them and corrected them so that the taxpayer is not going to be responsible for them. And so at this juncture, all I'm trying to do is make sure that the taxpayer is not going to be responsible for something that I don't have a crystal ball for. I, I fully hear you, and I'm a different person. I think I told you this before. I say I'm going to do something, I do it. Okay, good. Go ahead. I, I think it's important to say that it it may not even be your, it may be out of your control. It like you saying I don't shirk things it could be something totally different there could be for some reason it had to be sold or something it could be some other situation that's not out of your control so I don't think uh, anybody's pointing at you and saying you're not going to do this or you're not going to do that some lots of times things lots of times things start out with best intentions and then um, we've seen it so many times in Sycamus because Sycamus has had we've gone through these different things like you know, two mile um, on the channel. There's lots of different places where we're not happy with what has happened. And, and, and it, we can go back and the person that's sitting in your seat, it wasn't their fault. So I'm just, I'm just saying that it's not a pointing finger thing at all. I don't know. Personal, I'm just saying, yeah. we're all trying to work to the same end. Yeah. Okay, so with uh, the amendment, Servicing requirements proposed for lot one and lot two. Any further comments? Okay, so we the vote. All in favor? Carried. Uh, with that amendment is our recommendation. That's good for you. Okay. And does somebody want to say go oh, Canada? <laughs> And I think that that is the end of the agenda. So having that, unless there's something else, during the Planning and Development Committee meeting at 12.14 on uh, August the 10th, 2022. All in favor? We're adjourned. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Oh, I'd like to, I should have said, well, we're still.